Let's begin with these words that we continue to hear. You are a storyteller. You are a keeper of the stories that save. But what does it mean to be saved? As people of faith, as we've said the last few weeks, we know the answer to this question. We believe that God and Jesus do save, and that love wins. But as we've said, the story is not found in the answers. The story that saves us is found in the work. So we have started to sort through our mathematical type problem with all its variables. We entered last week into a new part of this big theological discussion. If we find salvation by overcoming sin, we must examine what is sin. How do we sin? Last week, we introduced this topic by reading the scripture that Western Christianity calls the fall. In this story, we are taught that Adam and Eve participated in the first sin, otherwise called original sin. We pointed out, however, at that time that this story does not actually use the Hebrew word for sin. That that actually comes later when Cain kills Abel. Instead, the Western idea of original sin began with Irenaeus' understanding of the scripture that we read today, Romans chapter 5. And that scripture was written by Paul to the Romans. Irenaeus, one of our founding church fathers, continued his ideas. And it continued in the writings of another founding father, Augustine. The concepts of original sin had caught on in the western part of Christianity, but not yet in the eastern part. And it was continued forward by Augustine's works, life, study, story, and experience. What's interesting is many people make theological statements rooted in the stories of historical theologians, and not actually directly from the Bible. And a lot of those people who make those kinds of statements don't even realize where their statements or thoughts began and came from. They do not know the name of Irenaeus and how he was arguing with a group known as the Gnostics. They do not know really a lot about Augustine and his arguments at the time against Pelagius. People often make answer statements without really knowing where the work and the stories of the people who did all the study came from that led to the answer as they understand it. They have answers that come out of their mouths without doing the work that these other people have done. And so I want to invite you as we continue forward in these big question times to spend some quality times with these group of men in your spare time. Because it's a part of understanding how we show our work and grapple with the insights of these theological historians, just as they did. Because none of these faithful people, writers and groups from Genesis to the early Christian theologians said, here's the answer, I've got it, I'm done. They studied. They asked hard questions. They argued, they struggled, they prayed. And they, in multiple ways, sought to connect with God. Some of their ideas and answers won out, and others became labeled as heretics. Some of their thoughts were followed by the western side of European culture, and others were followed by the eastern side of European culture. But they continued to work and work to know God through their understandings of Jesus and through their understandings of Scripture. They tried to reconcile and understand sin, salvation, and the other big religious life topics connected with these things. I think our current Christian culture has simplified the concepts of original sin and the fall in a way that we miss out on how profound this story can be and how profound what Paul wrote can also be. We have boxed in these stories and understandings in ways that limit the justification and grace that Paul actually talks about in today's scripture. You see, we can 
talk about these two scriptures, the one in Genesis and the letter part of Romans, for years and what they imply. In fact, people have been talking about them for years, hundreds of years. Why? Because at their core, they're not about what you need to know to pass a religious history course. They're about the big questions of life. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do good things happen to bad people? Why do we die? What rules matter in the world that need to help us get along? And where is God in all of what is happening? Standing in the middle of these two scriptures is the feeling we all know. Somewhere deep inside, it is that universal feeling that something, in some way, seems and feels broken. Our relationships with one another, our relationships with God, and even at times our relationships with ourselves seem disconnected. And so we begin to ask all those questions that we have been grappling with ourselves. How did brokenness in this way enter into the world? Why do we feel that sometimes God is absent and the world is bleak? Are people good? Are they bad? Are they sinners? Are they saved? Who sinned? How can we be saved? Who is to blame? And what happened? How can all of this mess be fixed? Do we need to do something? Or is, or is there nothing we can do? These are the same type of questions that are at the root of every artistic world. Like work. Artistic work. Like the Bible. So it makes sense that the Greek word for sin, hamartia, began actually with Aristotle's poetics. Aristotle was examining how a character in a play misses the mark. Thus, the plot moves forward as the character responds to his or her flaw or brokenness. You see, sometimes I think we get so caught up in the current images and words of saved and even of sin that it makes it hard to see the meaning of some of the scriptures in different ways. So I went back to change the word with flaws or miss the mark. Here is an example. Uh-oh, they just got out of order. Therefore, just as our flaws came into the world through one man, and death came through these flaws, and so death spread to all because all have missed the mark. Our flaws were indeed in the world before the law, but they are not reckoned when there is no law. Does that help you see it a little differently than getting caught up in the repetition of the word sin? For me, it gives me a way to re-empower myself so that I understand it. Because I see that we are all part of God's great work of art with our flaws and our plot lines. The stories in Genesis help point out to us that our greatest flaws come when we begin to move away from God. Even though God, again and again in the stories, never moves away from us. Whether we were born with that flaw because of Adam or not, I think that we can all agree that we as humanity are flawed characters. And that we as Christians and people of faith only know one character in all of history that overcame death and did not miss the mark and sin, and that would be Jesus. And that matters. It matters to us because in the story of our lives, we find this is where we as Christians can connect to the broken relationships that many feel, and we connect to God and with one and another. When I was a freshman in high school, I had to read Billy Budd and Lord of the Rings. Our final grades for that six-week period were based on two assignments. The second assignment was a midterm. It had two essay questions. The second essay question was to name Russo's theory and how it 
applied to the books that we had read. As some of you saw on Facebook this week, I have no idea in ninth grade what Rousseau's theory was and how it applied to anything that we had read. In fact, I found out a few days later I was not the only one in my classroom who had skimmed over that part of our notes. Many of the smart kids in our class got D's on their report cards. Yes, D's. I still cringe years later that D on my report card. But I do know the theory, and I've known it since ninth grade. The theory we were supposed to write about for that question was noble savagery. Basically, is there a character in the story that represents the good found in humanity? Did that character become corrupt? And if so, how does that character become corrupt? And at what point does this character become flawed? Or in some way savage? A simple, similar contemporary version of this question is, are you a good witch? Or a bad witch? I think we are all asking these types of tough questions about our humanity and about one another during this time of division in our country. We are trying to figure out, are people good or bad? Why? How do we as faithful people respond to the brokenness? How do we actually create stories that save and heal? How do we heal the world in which so much sin, flaws, and marks have been missed? Paul's answer is grace. Grace that is free. Grace is what helps us move towards faithful justice. And while we can continue deep discussion theologically over grace and works, at this time in our country, in our world, in our lives, in the middle of the cold, dark part of winter, the word and the message that God gave me in this scripture to share with you today is grace. Grace is not, however, a get-out-of-jail-free card and gives us an excuse to stop responding to all the difficulties and struggles and the hard conversations that are happening. Grace is actually a motivator. It is a motivator to help us move forward, to seek ways to heal the brokenness that is justified through our understanding of salvation through Jesus Christ. As I heard someone say, when sins seem to abound in our world, opportunities for grace abound as well. So give grace. Give grace to yourselves. Give grace to your pastor. More importantly, not only give grace, but let us work to teach, show, and be the experience of grace. Our world actually needs justification, as Paul said, through grace. And as storytellers, because we are the storytellers. We are the creators of the stories that say, we need grace to create stories of true salvation in a very 